Hello. Did everybody have a nice lunch for starters? Good. Uh, <laughs> um, there's always a bit of, um, well, there's a couple of challenges really into doing the first talk after lunch. One is that you're all feeling all nice and relaxed and you've come into this nice warm room and uh, you're likely to think, sit back, wait for things to happen and drift off. And so I'm on my guard for that. But um, the other thing is that being part way through the day, obviously a lot of really good points have already been made by previous speakers. And that's a bit of a dilemma. Do you, do you rush off at the lunch break and hastily rewrite your presentation or just sort of go with it? And we're going to go, go with it. And I'd, I think I'd like to pick out three things from this morning's presentations that we can carry into this one. And at those points where those issues arise, I know I can go a little bit faster and we've kind of already covered those off. So, I mean, I, th I thought it was very uh, telling to hear about the retraction of public service journalism in Asia. Um, same thing's been happening in the UK and, uh, you know, th those, th those points come into this uh, presentation really. We heard about the human need to share things on Twitter with the uh, Chilean earthquake example. And that, that is a human need. It's not a, a tech thing. It's not some, some sort of fad that's going to go away. That need to share the information that's important to you is, is I, wouldn't, I'd, I'd hesitate to call it even a trend. It's more of a movement than, than a trend. And then I think we've, we all know, and probably all knew before we came in here, but it's good to... Uh, hear some more evidence of it that big media needs to change to survive. So those themes really will in inform this uh, talk going forward. It's really the story of what hyperlo how like hyperlocal has happened and what sort of challenges and, fu and opportunities there are in the future. You'll see the, the picture on the screen is really very much the sort of territories of stories w that we're talking about. And I nearly called this um, talk actually dog food democracy and the hunt for digital revenues because those are really sort of key factors in how, how what this area is like as I say I want to share some research I've been doing in this area uh, look at the challenges and opportunities but I would like this session if it can to pr prompt some further discussion um, maybe not here in the room but outside the room and online uh, I'd be very interested to hear your views of this issue but I suppose we should start by talking about what hyperlocal means. Hy we've heard about hyperconnectedness. Um, I don't know whether this is actually microlocal, you know, in, literally in your backyard, or whether it's hyperlocal. The definition tends, uh, this is the Wikipedia definition, tends to hang on geography. And I, I can understand why, because the geography of a place is incredibly important to everybody and the geography of what's important to you could be where you live, it could be where you work, it could be where you go out, it could be where your mum lives, more likely that it's all of those sort of localities. So geography is very important and I wouldn't like to um, anybody to think you know otherwise. But I actually think there's more to it than that and what we talk about when we talk about hyperlocal stories is quite often more of an attitude. Um, I identified at, at one point on my blog 10 characteristics about hyperlocal, which weren't uh, really about the geography. Um, and I'll mention a, a few of them now. Um, one of them is the level of participation that the journalist or author, and it's not always journalist, but the level of participation from the person creating the content is more likely to be very engaged both online and offline. Another uh, factor in it is a sort of obsessiveness about covering a topic in a lot of depth. This can result in multiple updates of a story that, uh, you know, perhaps a traditional news journalist wouldn't think worthy of a separate story, but it could, you know, just a complete sort of dogged chasing of that one particular issue. In fact, some hyperlocal sites are just that one issue. And sadly, um, a lack of clear revenue um, is another sort of factor which does tend to unite the hyperlocal sphere, I'm afraid. Uh, why is it happening now? This is one of those slides that can go really fast because you already know about this from this morning. Um, but basically, the world's a changed place. And so, what have we ended up with? Um, really, in the UK at least, and possibly where you live as well. Hyperlocal is uh, something of a David and Goliath landscape. 
I'm going to go quite quickly through how the big media has sort of responded to the challenges of this. Um, but actually, the, I'm hoping that you'll find the uh, examples from the kind of independent sector uh, that come afterwards a bit more uh, innovative in a way. The biggest uh, media company in the UK has taken an approach to it, basically. In fact, in a way, you could describe uh, how the big media has, has come about it as either own it, sell it, or find somebody else to fund it. Um, Trinity Mirror, the biggest media group, is definitely in the own it category and has set up separate pages on their online presence where they invite uh, other bloggers that are already out in the community to um, submit content and be accessed via their site with the aim that in the end lots more page impressions and presumably advertising will follow. So very much a, a join us and, and we will sort of amplify your offering. The other one that's only just come out is t this idea. Are there any bloggers in the room? Lots of blogs in the room. How many of you would like to pay a major media company to run your blog? Yeah, this is a franchise approach where if you want to have a local website, you can pay £7,000 and uh, they'll provide you with some training and support to run it. And then you can make lots of money out of the advertising. So. I'm not quite sure how well this one's going to go. We'll keep an eye on this. I think we know, really, don't we? Um, a third approach, which hasn't actually got any traction, but was an interesting one, was the UK's um, National Press Wire, Press Association, put forward a, a project where they would provide council and courts coverage free of charge to whoever wanted it. So bloggers, independent news sites, mainstream media, whoever wanted it. Um, but be subsidised by the company to provide that service. This, as I say, hasn't really gone ahead. And then finally, the one that I was involved in last year was a year-long pilot project in three cities in Britain, which looked at putting a professional journalist on the ground in the city and working with local contributors uh, to unearth the stories that they wanted to tell and to find new ways of covering it. It was called Guardian Local. So that's really sort of innovation in the mainstream, but the, there is also this other up, upcoming uh, presence, I suppose, in the hyperlocal sites themselves. What you're looking at there is a map of Britain and the, all the sites that have set up. There's more than 450 of them operating. As you can see, they're quite well spread across Britain. Um, we'll have a look at a few of them to see what they're actually up to. Here's one. They've, um, this is a husband and wife team, and their interest in getting involved in local media is local accountability of their council decision making. So a lot of de decisions are devolved by government to uh, local authorities. These people felt it wasn't really being reported on and that local people didn't know about the issues, and so have decided to go along to every council meeting in the evening and provide uh, as near as damn it live reporting. How they do this, one of them goes down to the council chamber, they, they, the other one stays at home, they communicate between each other on Skype Messenger, file their reports back to the kitchen table, published online. The other way they do this, um, which I think sh it shows how you can use free tools to uh, produce some interesting journalism are things like shared documents. So they use Google Documents to document every vote taken over local council services cuts. Just simply a spreadsheet names how they voted. Now that sort of information used to be part and parcel of newspapers. And obviously a lot of newspaper journalists look at this and go, oh, well, who's going to want to go to the council every night? You know, who's going to carry on doing this? But these people are no kind of flash in the pan. They've actually been doing this for six years. So I think that shows how determined some people are on a single issue to get involved in this. A completely different approach, a site called King's Cross, um, which is the King's Cross area of London, um, which is looking at campaigning. So this isn't, and uh, William Perrin, who runs this, would say this is not about journalism. This is not about publishing. This is about um, activating the local community to take action there about issues that matter to it. Um, 
he set up uh, in 2008 an organisation called Talk About Local, which now trains people across the UK in doing exactly that, in empowering citizens to actually make a difference in their communities by challenging the authorities. As you can see there, there's a, they've done 700 articles. Their budget for doing this, they claim, is £8 a month. You know, there isn't a media organisation in the country that can p compete with low costs like that. Um, they're interesting as well because they really uh, campaign using all the tools that you'd perhaps consider to be journalism. Like uh, this week, they've put in a freedom of information um, report about a, a, an accident-prone junction, if I can put it like that, where a cyclist was killed, and unearthed the fact that this uh, design of the junction was actually uh, commented on in official documents for some time and no action's been taken. So this is now something that's headed towards the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson's desk, purely from the local activists knowing what's going on in their area. Um, as I say, a lot of what's happening in hyperlocal isn't about journalism, it's about community cohesion. And these people have done a lot of research in this area, which I'll just share a, a few headline sort of figures that you'll see how that stacks up. This one's a scary one. That big green block there is the majority of people who say that is their main, new, their main source for local news is neighbourhood websites. If you work for the local paper, you're that blue bit there, that, which is a quite a scary place to be, really. Um, but they've found some other interesting findings, and I thought you might be interested in these. I'm going to have to read them out because I couldn't remember them all. 91% um, of their respondents thought that people agreed that the local website expressed pride in their area. That's something important that came up earlier as well. It's not just the bad news all the time. It's actually the pride in belonging to that area, especially in these sort of deprived communities. 69% uh, felt their participation on the site had strengthened their sense of belonging. 95% uh, said they felt more informed about their neighbourhood because of the local site. And 92% agreed that people are helpful if somebody asks advice. That human need share coming up again, that they can tap into that local resource. If you're interested in those sort of findings around cohesion, um, that's from the Online Neighbourhoods Network Study of 2010. So finally, I've, I've included Help Me Investigate into this because they actually provide tools which mean that people can undertake their own investigations. So they're not publishing a, a local website as such, but they're allowing local websites to use their tools uh, to manage their investigations, if you like. So they bring people together around issues. Um, how many parking tickets have been issued in my city and who were they given to? You know, is there one particular area? That sort of thing. They're about to relaunch and concentrate on certain niche areas that are, their users are most interested in, like health and welfare. Um, they did a remarkable thing, which uh, any developers in the room will appreciate, that um, they, ha they found out about the costs of the local council website. I think it was something like 2.1 million. I had a look at it and thought, well, how did it cost that? And so, after revealing the fact that this cost, they spent 24 hours building their own equivalent of it at no cost, which um, I don't think the local council were too chuffed about. But Let's move on. Um, all this activity they've been doing has, has caused some perhaps inevitable friction between the mainstream and uh, the emerging, shall we say. Uh, this is Vosin, journalist on one of the Britain's biggest papers, who, um, as you can see, isn't too enamoured with what's going on in his uh, back garden, to say the least. Oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Then there's uh, it's, things took a rather curious twist in the north of England when a local website owner who in, uh, in his previous employment had done some work on adult sites, he's a web developer, and I should stress they were legal adult sites, 
um, found himself at the centre of sting operation by his local paper, where a young uh, female reporter turned up to ask him if he'd uh, build her an escort agency website, which um, caused a huge furore in the online world. Um, and a front page splash for the local paper when they decided to out this uh, web developer as somebody heading up a porn business which um, it resulted in complaints to the PCC and uh, actually the, um, the chap involved lost all the advertising off his site when people decided that having pictures of the local football, children playing football, perhaps shouldn't be placed uh, in the hands of somebody who's got some sort of connection to the adult industry. So it had a completely huge impact on his livelihood. And it's still going on. Um, even this week, there's, a, there's an editor and a blogger in London who just take chunks out of each other every day to the point where now the, the debate has more or less sunk to the, la the, the standards of just one will go online and the other one say, oh, you're tosser, you shouldn't be online. You know, and it's got really, really immature. So these things are, are going on because, um, you know, we haven't found a way for the two things to work together. So, I think Jeff Jarvis made a very good point on this. We're not, we're not, we're not going to go back to the point where you had a big news organisation and that's what there was and people waited and received things from it. You know, we have actually got to find ways of working together. And his uh, sort of definition, if you like, of an ecosystem made the point about the varying motives and I think that's very important that not all these startups are trying to be a, a big media. They are actually trying to do something in their local community. They're not trying to emulate journalism. They're doing something different. So how, how does that carry on for the future? Well, I've identified three challenges which we'll look at in this um, talk. One, continuity. It's very easy to set up a hyperlocal website. You could go home take you two hours or something to set up a site, buy a domain name, put all the contacts on it and off we go. Actually keeping it going for six years or however long is quite a different proposition, especially if there's only a small number of you. Um, there's no holiday, there's no pay, there's no, why would you bother? So the continuity aspect of some of these operations is actually quite a challenge. Revenues. Not everybody in this space wants to earn money. They're doing it for other reasons. However, there are some that do, and there are some that want to employ journalists to look at that sort of democratic deficit that's been left by the retraction of the papers, and they want to be paid for it quite reasonably. So revenues is still a big challenge. I don't kind of have a great answer to this other than to, uh, there are a couple of startups in this area, There's one in Britain called Adiply, which involves self-serve advertising. Uh, when I was putting this presentation together, I tweeted about it and asked anybody if they'd kind of solved the problem of revenues, because I hadn't noticed if they had, but would they mind telling me? And then uh, somebody got in touch with me, who was a bit upset that I'd said that because he felt they were doing very well and uh, they had uh, put this self-serve advertising up and had earned this year a thousand pounds. That's great. I don't want to belittle his efforts in that, but if you're looking at it from a media organisation point of view, that's obviously not the sort of revenues that we're used to talking about. Now maybe we should be. Maybe that's what we should be looking at, small enterprises with small continuous revenue. I don't know. And the third challenge is one where I'm, this is where I'm currently working at the moment in the kind of mobile space. And everybody in this room, I'm guessing, has a mobile phone. We all use it for news. Without being able to move over to mobile platforms, hyperlocals are going to quite easily lose their relevance in their local communities. It's not just good enough being there online. We heard earlier about you have to be everywhere, be everywhere that people are. So. This is how I'm thinking about the hyperlocal space at the moment. We, we, what we're actually looking at, if you're looking at any sort of local thing, is a social, local and mobile space. Apparently it's, this has got a horrible abbreviation of solo-mo, but I don't, I'm not sure that one's going to catch on. But 
you get the idea. You are actually an intersection of those things. So what's local to you, you want to be able to share with it, and it's got to be mobile. So the thing I'm involved in at the moment is a project. Oh, he agrees with me. I, I told him that, and yeah, he just came along. I um, The project I'm involved in at the moment looks at those three areas. Uh, it's called notice and is a way of taking things to your locality wherever that might be it might be where you are, are actually sat or it might be just somewhere that you're interested in or have a connection to and it's um we're calling it an uh, a community notice board because that seems to be a nice easy reference for people you you know everybody knows what a notice board is it's there you go to it you post something on it other people come along and look at it it's, it's got more to it than that in that it's got you know online sharing that's only possible by being online and all the rest of it. Um, but this, uh, I'm hoping, will actually answer that need. But if you've got very local news and information to share, you can share it easily with other people in that location without them having to go and search for it or find it, you know, find it out by visiting multiple sites. Um, the technology means that we can now know where you are because you'll allow us uh, to know that piece of information just as you do on Foursquare and then we can bring that information to you that other users have put in that space so people you trust have put in that space so I'd just like to end with a little plug for that because it's in beta at the moment we're testing it out I've been doing some testing here at the conference actually and if you're interested in an invitation to try and uh, join our beta testers on that if you go to www notice.com and the O is a zero um, you can sign up for an invite there so apart from mobile what's the futures to come out of it as I think we've talked about there has to be a potential for new partnerships and collaborations um, we can't sit in silos we've got to get together to solve this Possibility of state subsidy and funding. In the UK, this is really not likely, not unless you want to start a local TV company. But uh, I don't know what the situation is in other parts of Europe. It could be different. And it's always worth revisiting that and mentioning it, I think, just in case. Um, and we need to look at creating new and different sort of revenue streams and business models. And thank you. That's the end of that. But if I if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them here or on Twitter or online later. Okay. We will have a little. Oops, we would have a little time for questions. So, any questions related to? Thank you for your talk. Um, any questions related to the subject to Sarah? Here is one. I just give you my microphone. You're the first questioner. Do, <laughs> do these uh, hyperlocal sites yes. exchange information ever? Does it? Do they change the information that yes, they publish? Yes, like news or or anything else. Oh yeah. Or very, very I guess my so. question is what they have to uh, share with others, with other hyperlocal sites. Yeah. Uh, if, if I'm understanding you right, uh, do they update the information a lot? Change. Oh, exchange. I'm sorry. So, like, uh, perhaps people in a, a similar area could collaborate to cover that area more fully or something like that or swap things. I'm trying to think of some examples of that. I know that um, most people operating in this space tend to be quite collaborative by nature because they're short on resource and they, they need to be, basically. So things like linking between sites is really common and actually some really good practice there for mainstream journalists about how to do that. Um, I, I, I don't know of any formal kind of sharing agreements, but I, I, I think that would be an interesting thing to look at, yeah. Thank you. Another question over there that makes me run a little. A lot has been said about blogger burnout. You know, yeah. usually like the most common blogger uh, post is, "Hi, I'm really sorry that I haven't updated my blog." Yeah. Um, it seems like that would be much more the case if you had to sit through six thousand city council meetings. Yeah. How do hyperlocal people that manage to actually uh, 
maintain a, a momentum? How do they how do they uh, keep it going without completely burning out? I mean, some don't. I mean, you know, there is a, there is a dropout rate. Um, it's something whether it's it's a bit like your point actually. Whether there could some sort of collaboration between neighbouring ones might sort of take up a bit of that slack, a bit of that heavy lifting, perhaps over time. Um, it's it is hard to explain, but I think it is a completely compuls compulsive passion for whatever topic it is. And in some cases, I've noticed that the more um, the more difficult the situation, like in the instance of the Ventnor blog, they have quite a lot of problems with the council. The more determined people get, I think. You know, if it's somewhere that's really easy and you can just sort of float in and cover the council whenever you feel like it, I think those sort of places almost get less coverage than places that are quite difficult to get into. Perhaps that's just this kind of awkwardness of bloggers. I don't know. It's, but yeah, this it, it definitely relies on having a very high level of buy-in from the person that's taking part in it. Okay, we have uh, one more question. Yeah? yeah I, I didn't get the... Uh, if you could just re state the name of the uh, startup doing the self-service advertising. And also, I didn't quite get the significance of that. Are they actually only targeting hyper-local uh, companies? I mean, why is it so important? Um, the company's called Adiply, A W D I P L Y. Um, I don't think they. I think they take any anybody's business, but they are kind of. Um, they came out of being a solution to that problem. Uh, the problem with advertising revenues being that, that all that's really open to uh, people that run hyperlocal websites is kind of Google AdSense, um, which you know isn't going to work for them and, and doesn't really give that local connection. What they're trying to do and um, where it fits into the hyperlocal scene is to come up with something which would mean that a local butcher, baker, candlestick maker type enterprise um, can get online. Um, and small and medium sized enterprises find it difficult to get online and to actually have a targeted audience. I mean, it's easy to get online. They could just take loads of Google AdWords and off they go. But if they're seen in America, they have absolutely no interest to a very small enterprise. So I think that they've intended it to be the link there between the trader offering services and you know the, the wider community. Thank you. Any more questions? See, that's the... You get yourself into something here. Yeah. After lunch, <laughs> the second effect is people have talked over dinner. Uh, sorry, over lunch. And um, are more likely to ask questions. Okay, into here. Okay. Uh, I, I was curious what, what the Guardian uh, conclusion was. If you did a, a year experience, basically, a year long experiment, what they decided to do was specifically uh, how they deal with the issue of, say, a hyper local blogger who, um, and the traditional argument is that these people are going to be covering local council meetings and we don't have reporters covering the blogger. Uh, I'll take the last point first. I, 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 there aren't that many people covering local councils. Uh, there are some, and some that do an excellent job. And those that do it tend to do a good job because that's that's the reason for their being. You know, they set out to do that. Um, so the issue of quality control hasn't arisen greatly. I mean, I, I don't know any mainstream media who is using hyperlocal bloggers or even trying to instigate using hyperlocal bloggers to replace their staff in any respect, I have to say. Um, yeah, I, yeah, in Britain that hasn't happened, uh, but yeah, it's something that could happen. Um, on the other point, on the um, Guardian Local project, it was run for a year, three cities, it achieved very good um, audience engagement and um, was very popular in those local areas. Um, and lots of lessons are learnt from it which have informed other things like the notice project that I've told you about um, and also it's fed a lot of information into the Guardian has a thing called mutualization project which is about involving communities in, in their coverage not necessarily geographical ones more kind of niches and things um, so it's been a, it was a, a useful fact-finding mission in that way but not now part of the core strategy <laughs>